Hoppy, Hoppy, Hoppy. This is Hoppy Hour. What's up? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And from KFI in Los Angeles, Aaron Bender is on Hoppy Hour. What's up, dude? Ryan, how are you, man? I appreciate the uh, appreciate the invite, man. I'm doing great, bro. So I'm a huge fan of uh, just Los Angeles radio overall. Like I'm friends with the Woody Show. I listen to the shows on KFI. So when you added me last week on uh, Facebook, a lot of times <laughs> I'll get these like old radio guys that used to do radio in the '90s that add me, and I usually don't add them because I don't see a point of because I'm close to 5,000 friends, so I don't see a point of adding somebody. But when, oh, I saw, yeah. but when I saw that Aaron Bender added me, I was like, oh, crap. So then I, <laughs> I had to message you. Well, I appreciate it. I, mean, I was looking over your profile, and, and you know, for, for such a young kid, you, you're so ambitious, and you have so much going for you. Uh, it's, it's good to see. It's great to see. So how did you get into radio? Oh, man. I mean, out of high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I started out as a history major, was falling asleep in my first history class, and that's when I knew that that probably wasn't going to be for me. A couple years of business classes because I just liked working in an office. Uh, I had some experience working in my mom's office. I'm like, I could probably do that for the rest of my life. And it just just didn't feel right. It didn't click. And so I I said, you know what? Something's got to give here. And I sat there in my mom's kitchen with the college catalog, the community college catalog, Mount Sac, and I said, you know what, radio sounds fun, let me try it. And I just, I fell in love. A couple of years of broadcasting classes, I went to Cal State Northridge for a broadcast journalism degree, did a lot more radio there. You know, the requirement at the time was you got to work six hours a week at the radio station. I think I put in like 15 or 20 because I just, I, I, it sounds a lot like, the way you describe your love for radio is just, it's just always been there. And then when somebody lights it up, it's just been, it's been a wonderful ride since I'm going on 22 years since I first discovered like, okay, radio is for me, uh, 18 plus professionally. It's been, it's been amazing. So growing up, I was really into radio. Like I listened to all the shows cause I'm from Chicago. So I listened to all the shows up there, but now that I work in radio here in Tampa, I noticed that I'll listen to a few different podcasts like yours. I'll listen to Tim show. I'll listen to Woody. I'll listen to Howard, but dude, that's about it. I listen to like house music and rap music in my free time. (laughs) Have you noticed over the years that when you work in radio that you kind of need a separation from it? Yeah, I'll go in fits and starts where I'll listen to nothing but talk, whether it's sports or uh, I, I don't, I don't generally get into political talk, but I'll listen to like good talk radio. If it's not super political, I'll go in fits and starts where I'll listen to that for like a good week or two. And then what I'm at right now is I just need some rage against the machine or some like chill electronic music, or, uh, like if my daughter is in the car, I'd have no problem blasting Taylor Swift because I just need to completely unplug. So I, I feel you there. I know exactly what you're talking about. My thing's weird though with like grunge rock. Cause I'm really getting into like nineties grunge rock, but the problem is I can only listen to it between the time frame of like 11 in the morning to like maybe 7 PM. <laughs> Cause if I start listening to sound garden and I'm listening to their music at like eight or 9 PM, it gives me legit panic attacks. Cause it's so dark for me yep. at night. I need like EDM or like old hip hop or house music. It really depends on the mood. Cause like if I put on temple of the dog at 11 o'clock at night, I'm doomed. (laughs) Don't sleep on Johnny cash too. Cause Johnny cash that, uh, that I have, I think I have more Johnny cash than anything else on my, uh, in, in my, I guess it's Apple music. Now I was about to say iTunes, but they killed that. So I've got more Johnny cash than anything else. And, And it just, for whatever reason, fits whatever mood I'm in, regardless of what era I'm talking about for Johnny Cash, whether it's the country or like the, the really late, uh, Rick Rubin stuff. It's, it fits, it fits. I love it. So a lot of times I'll see people post memes online where they claim that they miss LimeWire and they miss iTunes and that dude, I don't miss it at all. I have Spotify and I have maybe like a thousand songs in my uh, playlist, literally everything from Beethoven to Temple of the Dog to Chingy. It's the most random playlist. I do not miss having to put songs on an iPod. I don't know about you. 
I don't miss it either. I mean, I a, a couple of days ago, maybe a week or two ago, I was thinking about buying like two or three songs, and I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> If anything, maybe I'll go to YouTube and download the MP3 and figure out how to put it on my phone that way. But it's probably going to come up on Spotify or TuneIn or iHeartRadio. Of course, I've got to talk about iHeartRadio. It's going to come up sometime. So let me just figure it out that way. My thing is, if I know a local artist here in Tampa or Chicago when I uh, interned at this dance radio show, if they came by and they talked about their new single on iTunes, I would buy it for like 99 cents, but I've never, ever bought an album because I'm just like, I can find it somewhere else. Like even when uh, Jay-Z two years ago released that music and you could just hear it on his app, I literally found a way to get it for free off of Reddit. Like I'm, it, the, dude, out there. I'm the dude that finds it for free. There's always a way. Do you feel bad by any means when you find music for free? Like you're not putting money in Drake's pocket? No, I mean, I I think you are on to something there when it comes to the local artists or the up-and-coming artists who really need that support. But my one play, my 99 cents or even less, is not going to make or break Jake. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to make or break Drake. Yeah, because um, I think about it, too. I'm like... I kind of feel bad though. Like if I were to like take, let's say Chingy and play it illegally. Cause I feel like somebody like him needs every single cent. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. There are a few artists who maybe they're either past their prime or trying to get back in the game. You're like, okay, yeah, fine. You know what? You get my 49 or 99. Go for it. Um, what do you think is going to happen within this next decade, because uh, people my age, we graduated in like between 2008 to 2012. I, gradu I graduated in 2012. I began getting paid in radio four years ago. Now I'm 26. Now I'm trying to begin like making it in radio. And most of the people in the 90s are now like 50 and 40, and they began at the age of 26. Do you think there's going to be like a resurgence soon where like people my age begin kind of getting their own shows because markets like Chicago, they keep rehashing the same people from the nineties, hoping that something is going to work. Like it's 1994. What do you think is going to happen within the next 10 years with kids, my age going into well, radio? If, if you had asked me 10 years ago, um, I, I would have said that I don't know how possible it is. Cause I, I'm not all that good at, uh, at seeing the future. I, yeah. I feel like I'm trying to get better at that, but I, I've never been one to really kind of put my finger on the pulse of what's happening next. That said, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I don't know that I would have known enough about podcasts to know that they would be so prevalent today. So I don't know what the next 10 years holds, but if it's anything like the last 10 years, there's actually more of an opportunity for young broadcasters to get their name out there because if they create a podcast and if they pair it with a YouTube channel and or Instagram and they get their promotion right, then that's one thing that I'm still trying to hash out and I'm still trying to work on. If they get that all right, understanding that it's going to take more than a month. It's going to take more than six months. It might take one or two or three years of just grinding through that process. Then they can make a name for themselves that way to the point where a lot like broadcasters on the air now, like the JT, the Bricks, and others who started as callers on shows like Jim Rome and others, and now have their own shows, you do podcasts like what you're doing and you grind away and understand that one day it's going to happen. Whatever it is, there will be some sort of break that you will be rewarded with for all that hard work that you're putting in. Then there's opportunity there that there wasn't, you know, five or 10 years ago. Now podcasts, you know, podcasts were around, yeah. but they weren't as understood or as prevalent as they are today. 
and young broadcasters have more of a, more of an opportunity now to make a name for themselves than ever before. Okay, this is going to sound a little bit selfish, and maybe I'm a bit of a narcissist, but it kind of annoys me that every single person has a podcast. Like you've been in radio for 20 years, so you should have one. So it might be hypocritical because I'm trying to like make it as like a big name in radio, but like the thing is though is like so many people have podcasts and then they do four of them and then it just sits on iTunes that it's like it's hard for right. the it's hard for the people that literally want to do a podcast to get noticed. I mean, it's cool. I'm on every podcast app, but then like I'll look at Spotify and there's like crappy sound and it, it, I feel like there should be like an acceptance where it's like it must sound this way because when I like go on like a dating app or I talk to people at social functions and I say that I have a podcast four years ago, people were amazed. So like, wow, that's really awesome. Now it's kind of like saying, Oh, I wake up in the morning and I eat food. <laughs> it seems like it's literally, if you don't have a podcast, you're not doing life right. It's very weird where it's going. Yeah, it is kind of an odd situation now, because like you said, it feels like everybody has a podcast and that was actually one of my concerns when I was getting into the podcast space yeah. in January was, okay, what can I do that nobody else is doing? How can I differentiate myself and separate myself from other people who have podcasts? Because we're talking about three quarters of a million podcasts are out there with billions of downloads and listens and all that stuff. But if you look at the numbers even more, and I forgive me if the number has changed, but the last time I saw the average number of episodes per podcast is seven. Yeah. Because so many people give up after just one or two or three, like you mentioned, and it just sits there. And the market will dictate which podcasts rise to the top. You know, the the idea of, okay, I'm going to search for, in doing research for guests, for example, I'll find a podcast that may or may not end up having anything to do with the guest I'm researching, but I'll, I'll click on it and it's like 2013 is the last time they posted an episode. Nobody's going to listen to that. They'll just move on to the next. And yeah, it sits there and it's taken up space or whatever, but nonetheless, it's the market will dictate where... Uh, whose podcasts are most successful or most listened to or serve their purpose and serve their niche. I mean, you, you get podcasts that have only 50 or 60 listens and that's all that that person needs because they're serving their, their audience, they're serving their niche. And if that grows or if it shrinks, so what? They're enjoying it and they're putting out the content that they want to put out. And like I was saying before, the idea that something might just hit and click and next thing you know they completely blow up if that's what they're looking for what i um did was i began going on youtube and listening to old 80s through 90s radio like howard opie and anthony wolfman jack and i thought about it because i kind of did like a dry show with a co-host with no production but now like i play music in between breaks and then when I come back, I do like bumper music, which is like house music from the 80s. So like nice. what I'm doing to try to separate myself from every other podcast is I hate the like dry, like I want to get into Joe Rogan, but I, I need like production. Like I like how Tim comes back from break and there's bumper music and he plays right. news clips. And I kind of do the same thing where I play news clips, but mine's more frantic where I'll play it for four seconds and then rip into it. But I take pride in <laughs> I take pride in that because no one else is doing that. Because like everybody else I know that has a podcast, they're all trying to do that Joe Rogan thing where it's just a three hour like uh, it sounds like an audio book. But for me, I try to make my show sound like a circus, like try to be like the PT Barnum of a podcast because nobody else is doing it anymore. It's such an ancient way of doing radio that that's why I'm trying to do it is to be yeah, different. finding your niche is is the key. And finding your spot in whatever space you're working, whether it's podcast or radio or TV or YouTube or Instagram or, you know, name the other 362 platforms out there. Finding your niche is so key. So why should people check out everything you're up to? Oh, man. I mean, 
I, I would I would appreciate it if for no other reason uh the the guests ninety five percent of the guests who I've had on the on the podcast have come to me, whether it's I'm in, in Burbank at iHeartRadio or it's uh at Cal State Northridge where I, I teach a couple of days a week. They've come to me and they've got a story to tell. That's that's my favorite part about this podcast is that it highlights the stories of all of these storytellers, whether they're news anchors or reporters or show hosts, or maybe they're working behind the scenes doing social media or you name it. And they all have these really cool stories that, which for me, it's more about their story than it is like, okay, let me make sure I get my clicks. Let me make sure I, you know, I, I, I only find guests who have, you know, X number of followers or whatever. I want a story because the story's gonna the story's gonna sell. The story's gonna bring the ears and and bring the clicks, whether it's now or in a year or five years. And I just I really enjoy what I do and I, I think the guests also from you know, from what they've said, they enjoy coming in. And so if you go to newsbender dot com, it has all of the different episodes I've done. Uh I'm right around the fifty mark, which you know, as as you know, being in the podcast game, 50 is like, that's like benchmark number one, because most podcasts, like I said, most podcasts don't even get out of single digits. And then I've wanted to hang it up 15, 20, 25 episodes in because I was getting burned out because it was just a grind. I had to feed that beast. And that podcast monster kept knocking on the door because when I first started, I was doing two a week. And it just got to be a super grind. And but now I've kind of settled into a once a week post and it's just it's a passion. And I, I feel like you can tell that when you hear it. Uh, real quick, because we have a few minutes. Is it weird teaching? Do you feel like you're going to offend the new woke generation? No, I, I don't think I mean, my brand of teaching, I, I don't really cross all that many lines yeah. because I, I'm teaching broadcast journalism. So yes, we do step into some territory that might make people uncomfortable, but I also tell them right off the bat, if something is making you uncomfortable, either let me know or step out for a minute, or, you know, if you feel more comfortable sending me an email after class, I mean, you know what we're going to be talking about week to week. It's right there in the syllabus. So I, I've not, in the six years I've been teaching, I've not, as far as I know, offended people to the point where they're going to complain. Um, but we get into some sensitive topics I have no problem talking with because we have a very diverse student population at Cal State Northridge. So I have no problem talking about issues that might make white people uncomfortable or people of color uncomfortable. But that's the point of journalism is to push the boundaries and push the envelope to get stories out there that aren't being told, you know, it's not, I mean, every, anybody can do a story right now on impeachment because it's, it's a large topic. You can figure out a way to talk about it, but not everybody is going to be uh, able to tell the small stories about the mom and pop shop down the corner. That's getting pushed out because of big business or whatever. And if you can do those small stories, then you're going to be a successful journalist because you'll know how to cover any story if you know how to cover local and small. Well, dude, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show, and I would love to have you on again sometime. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Anytime, Ryan. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, bro. Hoppy, hoppy, hoppy. This is Hoppy Hour.